Hello and welcome to the Small Town Tourist Podcast where we experience and explore everything that makes small towns great. I'm your host, Abby, and today we are heading to the town of Sock Center, a town we've definitely visited before on this podcast, but they got a lot of cool stuff there. And today we are talking with Emily Kramer, who works at 510 Art Lab, which is a place that was described to us by her kind of like a gym, but for art and creating things. So you become a member there, you get a key, and then you get to go make art. You get to try new things. You get to hone in your skills. It is such a cool place and such a great concept and such a nice asset to have in the Sock Center community. And not only did we talk about the 510 Art Lab with Emily, we also talked about her own podcast that she does. And I got links to everything we discussed down in the show notes below. So be sure to check that out and give Emily a follow as well. Please enjoy our time hanging out with Emily Kramer of the 510 Art Lab in Sock Center. Hi, I'm Emily Kramer. I'm from the 510 Art Lab in Sox Center, Minnesota, and I don't know what I'd do. <laughs> <laughs> I do everything because I want to do it all in life. <laughs> Multi-passionate human. Yes. That's probably true. I wear a lot of hats. So yeah, marketing, class prep. I also teach art. So yeah. So I connected with Emily because she's been emailing me about these amazing events that you're having at the Art Lab. And unfortunately, my schedule is so dang chaotic. I can't make it to any of the ones you've sent to me, which hurts my soul to its very core because they are truly really cool things happening in a small town. But uh, just give me a little bit of background on what the Art Lab is all about, what you guys do there. The Art Lab is like a maker space, if you've heard of that term. It is similar to the best way I can describe it, I think, is like a gym membership, but for art. So, and we we have various ways to get involved without membership as well, which I'll tell you about. But you sign up to be a member as one option and you get a key to the door and you can come in 24-7 and come make art in various forms. We have countless ways to do art, like pottery and stained glass. We have glass fusion There's all kinds of painting, sketching, drawing, a lot of fiber art, uh, sewing, macrame, weaving. We have these giant weaving looms, which are pretty cool. We have a commercial kitchen. So there's cooking involved once in a while. A 3D printer, which is fairly new for us. And we're still getting used to that and learning how that works. And a giant cricket machine that does amazingness that I'm not, I haven't even used it yet. (laughs) So there are quite a few art forms to get involved with there. And then there, we also teach classes. So you can, anybody can sign up for a class. Uh, members get a discount, but like anyone can sign up for a class. We teach all kinds of different art and uh, we bring in instructors from all over to enrich the community with various art forms. We're always bringing new things in, which is also neat. We, we're morphing and try to stay agile with the demands and desires of our artful community. And we have events too. Like you mentioned, we have a poetry reading coming up. We have a storyteller coming in. We've got various musicians lined up to come in through the spring and summer as well. We're trying for once a month to do, we have, we created what we called the listening room because visual art is one form of art and performance art is another type of art. So we're trying to expand a little bit there and have a more well-rounded art community. That's incredible. It's like a snap fitness just to go and create, which is so needed because people don't have that creative outlet anymore. There's not like artisans like we read about in history class in school. It's so nice that you guys are offering that, especially in the community of Sock Center, because it is pretty rural. I mean, it's Mm -hmm. that's like kind of the middle of nowhere. You guys are on 94. So you got that going for you. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> right. Yeah. We're pretty close to 94. That's helpful. But it's so great that you're offering that for a community that is kind of starving for that kind of entertainment and outlet. Yeah. Especially once it, once you become an adult, it's harder to find places outside your own home to go do that aren't, you know, a bar or something like that. You can come hang out. The community at the Art Lab is something that is difficult. It's like an intangible benefit coming there and and seeing the same art art based people and getting to know them and making new friends and things like that is one aspect of it that I guess I originally didn't expect but and now I have you know lifelong friends having been there now for a few years 
Yeah, you find those like-minded people and you're like, oh, and Mm -hmm. your art may be different, but you have the same outcome of just wanting to create. Yeah, and everyone there is so helpful too. One cool thing too is we we encourage dabbling. A lot of people are held back from doing various forms of art because of all kinds of reasons. Fear, thinking they're not creative, hesitancy to dive in because they're not familiar with the art form. And we've created ways to be able to go ahead and do it anyway, which is something that breaks down a lot of barriers for people and makes it accessible to, you know, like I've never done pottery before. And I was able to go in and grab a block of clay and make something. And we have like televisions in every room. They're smart TVs. So you can pull up like YouTube and tutorials, or you can cast from your phone, which is another awesome part of it. So I can like look up like a video I want to follow, maybe to paint a picture or to create a piece of a pottery or something. And I can follow along on the YouTube video right there in the art lab. We also have QR codes all over. So like it'll show you how the equipment works and the safety protocols with various things. So you can learn how to run the equipment by watching a video, by scanning a QR code versus, you know, waiting to be taught how by someone because we are a nonprofit. So um, we don't have full-time staffed hours. So it is kind of a self-help kind of situation, but we've created those ways that you can. I know a lot of people are very much, oh, I'll just learn how to do it myself. YouTube University, because you can learn almost anything, but it is nice that you offer those QR codes to be like, okay, well, here's a Cricut machine. And if you've never worked with one before, they are so daunting. But if you have that (laughs) helpful resource to be like, okay, well, here's the basics of getting started. Mm -hmm. Right. Like I said, our members help each other quite a bit too. Like a lot of what I learned from pottery was from other potter members. So that like that community comes into play there too. And the 3D printer personally is above and beyond my capability, but I still intend to try to dive in because I feel like the art lab does something where it gives you the kind of empowers you to feel like you can. So I personally feel that with that equipment that like you said, it's it's daunting. <laughs> <laughs> I've watched TikToks of 3D printers and I go, oh, there's so much that could go wrong. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but as a serial dabbler myself, like I'm looking around my basement right now and I always call this area of my house the small scale crafts direct because <laughs> I always like I find something new and I want to pick it up. I don't want to try it. Like I got really into the friendship bracelet craze and I'm looking at the cricket that I have over there. I have a whole room dedicated to sewing. It's nice that you're offering a space for people who might not have the resources to go out and buy everything necessary to come out and try it. Yes, exactly. Before you make an investment, especially big things like a kiln or something. Oh like my that. gosh. <laughs> but even a sewing machine, you know, yeah. Um, you want to come in and just have a pair of pants you could without the investment or just like you said to try it and see if it's for you yeah because I find a lot of my stuff on like Facebook marketplace and I'm like well I guess we're dropping 40 bucks here and we're gonna try it out exactly (laughs) I would do the same but then it's also (laughs) taking up space in my house that I mean it's valuable flat surface that could be filled Mm -hmm. with something else so it's nice that you do have it all condensed into one building Yeah. The number one thing I hear is I have this old sewing machine that I got for Christmas or I bought on Facebook Marketplace and I'm just, I'm terrified. I have no idea even how to run it. And we're running, we need to post it, but we're running pretty often now a beginner sewing class where you can just get familiar with your machine. We sit there and walk you through it. And so things like that help people also use their equipment that they do have at home. And what a helpful resource because it's something that they're not teaching in schools anymore. Like, oh, are they not? No. <laughs> Probably I have an not. aunt yeah. who's a home ec teacher or family and consumer science, I think is what they're calling it now. But yeah, she said they're not teaching sewing anymore. Oh, no, that's tragic. Which is tragic because I loved that part of like middle school when they taught us how to sew a gym bag. I'm like, this is amazing. <laughs> yeah. And now you have a gym bag that you made yourself. Exactly. How cool is that? Yeah. Right. So it's great that you guys are that resource in the community because it, it is needed. I mean, the place in my town that does like tailoring and alterations, they closed down because they couldn't find seamstresses to work. So it's a huge need. It is. Yeah. So what kind of classes do you teach? Because you said you're an instructor. Yeah, I teach uh, glass fusion and also the sewing class, the beginner intro to your sewing machine class. I teach that. We have other teachers that teach other sewing. But yeah, glass fusion is something that I learned primarily just to expand it in the art lab because I saw that it was, it's a beautiful art form. It's where we take glass in various forms, big chunks, little chunks. The cool thing about glass fusion is there is zero waste. So you can use 
a big piece of glass and cut it down into like the little piece you want. And then all the little scrap can be even ground down to glass powder. And even the glass powder can be used in various ways to decorate and create glass fusion pieces. And glass fusion can be, we melt it in the kiln then. So it can be, you can make sun catchers or like uh, little dishes and bowls and bases. There's a lot of different uses for molten glass, like once you melt it down. And there are a lot of different techniques and things. So it's fun and it's pretty. I know there's something about when the light catches it. It's kind of like a, I don't know, to me, it's it's similar to stained glass, but maybe a little more fun for me anyway. I have a piece of glass fusion art that I bought at a craft fair a while ago. Oh, yeah. And it's, I have it right in my kitchen window. So I see it every single day and I absolutely love it. It's a little cactus. And I'm like, oh, it just brings me a little bit of joy. And it's uh-huh. a gorgeous piece of art. And it's cool that someone made it. Yeah. So how did you get into working with the art lab? How did your role come about with it? I started by being recruited to teach sewing classes. And then that was right in the middle of the pandemic. Oh, gosh. 2020. (laughs) And so then I became a volunteer after that where I sat in there and during business hours to like just have staffed hours there. And we, we ran quite a bit on volunteers during that time. We still do to some degree, but... I stepped up and wanted to make this happen because I believed in what it was doing in the community. And the fact that it's a nonprofit makes it uh, another level of awesome to me because they're not trying to make money on it. It's about enriching the community. So I got involved and then some hours opened up and I was able to be hired on and they needed somebody to help with some marketing. And I have that background. So it worked out nicely. What does the team consist of there? How many people do you guys kind of have helping steer the ship? Um, Well, we have six people on the board and uh, a board liaison, and then staffing the place is generally myself and Shauna. So if you come in, you'll see mostly the two of us, and occasionally a board member or two will come in and be there on staff. Okay, cool. So how does the membership then work? Do you have to go in in person, or can you sign up online? And what is kind of the average monthly cost of that? Well, um, we have a few different plans. One is yearly. So that's 300 a year, which breaks down to like 25 a month. And that covers a whole year. It comes with a couple of guest passes. So you can bring a friend and be there for the day and make art together. It comes with a gift certificate that you can use toward classes or some supplies that we have for sale. A lot of times supplies are covered automatically, depending on what art form you're doing. But we also sell supplies and then a few other benefits like member only classes and things like that. And then we also have a six month, which is $200. So it comes out to a little more per month, but you have the same benefits. It's just a shorter length of time. And you, I believe you only get one guest pass, but you can always purchase more guest passes. Those are $25 for the day. And then we have currently, we have a three month membership, which is 150, which is pr- like that ends up being $50 a month. And then we're also rolling out a monthly membership as well, which can be like a recurring withdrawal from your account as well. Okay, cool. And And you can sign up at the 510artlab.com or you can show up in person and sign up that way. That three month is such a good idea, especially for like these winter months in Minnesota Mm -hmm. where people are like, "Eh, I don't really got anything else going on, but my spring and summer are pretty busy. So that's fantastic. And we see the we see the vice versa of that too. A lot of people come up and spend the summer here at their cabin on the lake or you know, we have a lot of um, like grandparents in town that have grandkids that come in for the summer and then they can come get a three month membership and bring their grandkids in. And that's kind of a, a fun thing we're starting to see more and more of. That's wonderful. Yeah. So we can cut this part out if it doesn't pertain, but I get because people know I'm the crafty person in their lives. OK, so yeah. like every now and then I'll get a call and someone will be like, hey, I have all these extra art supplies. Do you want them? And then they just end up on my front porch. Do you guys take donations like that or... We do. What we like to know what we're looking at because sometimes we get a surplus of things that we don't need. Right. Or we get things that are unusable, which we don't like to waste, but sometimes it ends up happening because we'll just get dumped on. Mm-hmm. Uh, we end up I with like that. a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we end up with like a lot of fabric or like a. So, and it's interesting because. And, and furniture, it'll be like, oh, I'm getting rid of this old desk. <laughs> We've gotten a lot of desks that way. So I encourage people to call or contact us and see if it's a good fit um, because you actually, most people want to feel good about helping, which is why they want to give it instead Mm -hmm. of just throw it away. So you will feel better about helping by making sure it's a good fit for the things you're giving. 
Okay, cool. So let's switch gears here. When we were setting up this podcast interview, oh, I just hit my mic. Uh, when we were <laughs> setting this up, you mentioned to me that you have a podcast. So tell me all about it. Thank you. I have an arts podcast called The Modern Romantic. And it's something I started a couple of years ago. We just hit our, we just started our third year, I should say. And we celebrate romanticism, not romance like romantic love, although that's part of it. Um, it's romanticism. So it's celebrating the softer side of life. So in literature, poetry, in art, we um, we interview artists and different people at different stages of, in different forms of art and different stages of whether it's a career or if it's just their passion. We just want to talk to people and how they did it and their journey and all of those details. We love talking about inspiration and it's all meant to encourage our audience so we've we've been very lucky to have interviewed some higher profile people but I love I love talking to the gamut of any artist. So we've interviewed people that are artists that maybe only five people know about but their art is amazing and we want to talk about that because we believe that art can be done by anybody. Anybody is everybody is creative and it's mostly about just doing it versus monetizing it and having to make it successful. You can do it for you. Yeah, you just got to start creating. I always, when people say to me, oh, I'm not creative. I couldn't do that. I'm like, actually, you probably can. And you're probably really good at it. You just got to try. Exactly. And that's really, when we ask for advice from our guests, um, we always ask for a little bit of like, what would you tell somebody who's just starting out doing what you do? And that is number one thing that they say. What you just said is you kind of just have to do it. Just dive in. And getting rid of that those obstacles, like I said before, fear and um, imposter syndrome is real. And all of those things that go, oh, time management, you know, those are things we're helping. I, I feel anyway, that we're helping people to overcome. Yeah. And imposter so. syndrome is a huge one. I know even when I started this podcast, I'm like, there's so many other podcasts. Like, do I really need to be doing this and cluttering the internet with more of this? And I'm like, no, you know what? I'm going to do it. There's cool stories to be shared and I want to help share them. Right. And you never know whose life you're touching and what someone else's view of it's going to be. You could be the bright, shining light in one person's day, and that's worth it. Exactly. And chances are good you'll never hear from that person, but <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> you got to have the delusion to know that, yes, there are those people out there that want to hear from you, that you want to, they want to hear the stories that you're helping to share. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's for good, which I believe in. So your podcast has come out weekly, monthly. What's kind of the schedule with that? We do weekly. We record via live stream, which is a whole nother challenge in and of itself on Monday evenings at 7 p.m. Central. We do a live stream to our social media outlets. So YouTube, Twitter, Twitch, Instagram, and Facebook. And you can tune in live. You can be in the chat. You can interact with our guests. We've had some really really cool guests, people you might recognize, and even just like local people, local painters and things like that. So local Minnesota people and people in the U.S. Well, all over. We've interviewed people internationally. and But you can interact with them, which is cool. They get to see what you're typing in the chat, and we get to ask those questions, and they get to answer them. And we've it's kind of a community on those live streams, which is awesome. And then we also release to all the spot like Spotify, Apple, and the major podcast outlets. So you can just listen to the episode later as well. That's really cool. Do you have a personal favorite interview that you've done? Man, there's so many benchmark ones. One of the big ones, because we started out so small, we were like, you know, I'm interviewing my boyfriend because he's a chef, you know, <laughs> because it was like, well, we need to just start with something more comfortable. We you know just got to so start easy. Yeah, exactly. So my big personal, there was a big personal one that for me, because I do photography as another art form. And I look up to Brooke Shaden, who is a, a fine art photographer who makes her living doing that. And she's phenomenal. She teaches classes and I've taken her classes. So to get her on the show is like a big deal for me. I was so nervous. When she said yes, I was literally jumping up and down in my, in my kitchen. I saw my email on my phone. And I was like, ah, <laughs> And so that was huge for me. And it's one thing, I guess, I don't know how to describe this, but all artists are really just people. These higher profile people you've heard of are still people. So we're sitting interviewing them. And even though that's like a personal hero of mine, it was like a, something to kind of overcome as far as 
still seeing them as human, which I've been able to do now. But a lot of people, I think a lot of people would have been in my shoes anyway, to experience that, like, you know, we all have heroes. And Mm -hmm. so to be able to sit down and actually talk to them. And I've realized through that too, every single week when we interview an artist, they all do that for me. All of them become my hero because they are all doing some form of art and it's all amazing to me. So it's not just the high profile people, but Brooke Shaden was definitely like one of my big benchmark ones. And then more recently, Felicia Day, we just released the episode. She's known from like the show Supernatural and a few other web series she's done. That how was kind of a big deal for us. How are you reaching out to these people? Is it just a cold pitch or like sending a DM on Instagram and hoping for the best? Sometimes we have a wonderful scheduling manager named Sandra who helps reach out. We got an IMDb Pro account, which oh, helps wow. so we can actually access agents and things like that. So we've gotten re- we've gotten really lucky. Also, word of mouth has helped. You know, you can kind of network your way. Um, which is what we did mostly because at the end, once we go offline uh, off of our live stream, we'll sit and chat for a minute and say, thank you for coming. If you have anybody you think would be good for the show, you know, we're always interested in referrals and that's how we've gotten some of our more high, higher profile guests. But like I said, it's not even the higher profile ones that really enrich the show. Those people are just successful in the public eye. Mm -hmm. So I don't ever want the show to just be high, high profile people. Because that's not what it's about. Yeah, it's about shining the spotlight on literally anyone doing an art, yeah. doing an art mm-hmm. form and putting it out for the world to consume and enjoy. Exactly. That's yeah, incredible. Well I love talking with other podcasters because I'm fairly new into this journey. I just hit my one year mark with this show. Oh, congrats. And it's just so nice to connect with people who have kind of walked this path before me and hear how they've had success and what mm-hmm. impact their shows have had on their lives. Yeah, absolutely. I like talking to podcasters for the same reason. Plus, we're all just a yeah. chatty group of people. <laughs> That's true. With really great mics. And really, <laughs> yeah, and an affinity so to clearly. really nice microphones. <laughs> <laughs> I always find myself going, I don't need to buy another one. I don't need to buy another one. Like Rode just came out with a purple microphone. I'm like, I don't need it. I just mm. bought two microphones, but that one's purple. So maybe I should get it. <laughs> right. Yeah, I've been thinking about getting a new one, too. Like, do I need one, though? Mm, I know. That's <laughs> right? always... It's always the war at heart. <laughs> <laughs> well, I truly appreciate you taking the time to be on my podcast, share details about your podcast, and talk about the Art Lab because I think it is just an amazing resource. Anything that people need to be on the lookout for with the Art Lab coming up in the next few months? Well, we have the storyteller coming in in February, and then she's teaching storytelling classes in March, which I think is an awesome thing that we haven't offered before. We have a big pottery series and a stained glass series for classes coming up. And then um, we're going to have a summer music lineup that I think will be really fun. And it looks like we're going to potentially be bringing some music lessons on board, um, starting with guitar. Really? Yeah. That's exciting. Those aren't set up yet, so it's something to watch for. Awesome. And where can people follow the Art Lab on social media? Facebook and Instagram under 510artlab.com. Or not .com. I'm sorry. (laughs) Facebook and Instagram under 510 Art Lab. (laughs) I'll make sure I have all the links in the show notes below as well. So easy access. (laughs) Well, this has been absolutely fantastic. Emily, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for checking out another episode of the Small Town Tourist Podcast. If you know of something cool that you think I should check out, go ahead and send it to me, Abby, A-B-B-E-Y, at thesmalltowntourist.com. If you're looking for more content, you can always follow me at The Small Town Tourist on Instagram as well as Facebook. And don't forget to leave a rating and review of this podcast. It helps out a ton. 